Hello and welcome to part two of our tree and shrub identification hike where we will be covering the shrubs. If you haven't watched part one, I'd recommend you do so since we talk about some of the vocabulary that we'll be using today on the leaf shape and the structure. But right now, let's go ahead and get started looking at some of our shrubs. We're going to start where we left off at the last video with the willows. We ended that video with trees with alternate branching. So we'll transition right into shrubs with alternate branching. I had mentioned that most of our willow diversity around here is actually from willow shrubs. So differentiating the different species of willows can be difficult, but you can tell a willow apart from other trees by its long skinny leaves and a lot of our wetland willows will have what are called stipules or leafy bracts on the base of the leaves. And willows oftentimes form thickets in our wetlands. If you think about pussy willows or sandbar willows. Hazelnut is another native shrub and it's one of my absolute favorite woody species. The leaves aren't super distinct, they're fairly oval shaped and are doubly serrate and the texture of them is very, very soft. Hazelnut is one of our suckering shrubs, so instead of having one main trunk, it has many, many shoots coming out of the ground. And hazelnut does form actual hazelnuts, which are a local favorite for our squirrels and other mammals. And the hazelnuts are produced on these really, really interesting shaped fruiting structures. I'm not even going to describe it. I'm just going to show you a picture. Okay, let's move on to some of our invasive species. We only covered two invasive trees, but we have an awful lot of invasive shrubs to cover. So we can start with the infamous buckthorn. Buckthorn is one of our most problematic invasive species. Uh, one pretty easy way to tell if buckthorn is in a woodland is just to look at the structure of the woods. If the understory is so thick and dense that you couldn't possibly walk through it, you're probably looking at either a buckthorn or a honeysuckle thicket. So buckthorn can appear either opposite or alternate, even on the same branch. The leaves are kind of oval shaped. They're usually fairly wide with a point on the end and they have very indented veins that curl up towards the top of the leaf. The bark varies widely depending on the individual plant. It can be smooth to irregularly rough with age. And it grows little branch stubs that kind of act like thorns. You can tell the difference from cherry by checking for that characteristic cherry smell on the underbark of young branches. Or if you actually cut back the bark on the trunk a little, if it's a buckthorn, you should see a very bright orange under bark. This shrub here, autumn olive, is one of our problematic invasive species, especially in prairies in our area. It's most easily identified by this silvery sheen that seems to cover the leaves and the young twigs. If I move this around in the sunlight, maybe you can kind of see the sun reflecting pretty brightly off the undersides of the leaves. Even as you zoom in to each individual leaf, you can kind of see this odd glandular pattern on them. Like the whole leaf is covered in little white bumps that kind of shine in the sunlight. The leaves themselves are simple. They're just one of those elliptic football shaped leaves coming off in an alternate branching pattern. And the shrub itself can actually get quite large and when it does the bark matures and it becomes pretty deeply fissured and gray. And as it grows older it also gets thorns so watch out if you're cutting it down. It will be covered in a lot of flowers. It has white flowers that have a really, really strong perfume-like fragrance. Sumac is another one of our native shrubs. 
This one has super long leaves that look pretty similar to our walnut with over 13 leaflets per each leaf on a pinnately compound leaf. One key difference with walnut is that sumac typically has a true terminal leaf, whereas walnut usually doesn't. Sumac is a clonal species, so if you have it, you'll usually find a very dense patch of it. And it doesn't get tall like a tree, but it, it can reach over 10 feet tall if it's fully grown. If you're still trying to tell the difference between that and walnut, you can crush up the leaves and check for that pleasant walnut odor, which sumac will not have. Moving on to some of our smaller pokey shrubs, we can start with the roses. Unfortunately, our most common rose around here is the multiflora rose, which is a problematic invasive species. So roses have a lot of branches all originating from the same point called a crown. And multiflora rose likes to send its branches out. And if they touch the ground, they'll reroot and start making other little multiflora rose bushes. We do have native roses around here. You can tell the difference from a variety of different ways. One of the easiest ones is by the flowers. Multiflora rose has many, many tiny white flowers that aren't very showy, while our native roses have large pink flowers. You can also look at the base of the leaf where there is a structure called a stipule. Multiflora rose will have a very frilly stipule, while all of our native roses will have a solid rectangular shaped stipule. Also, sometimes you can look at the thorns. Multiflora rose has these wicked stout back curved thorns, which are totally meant to catch the legs of any passerby and make them bleed. And although some species of our native roses will have stout thorns like this, the majority of them will have smaller bristles that are a lot less menacing. Black raspberry is another one of our native pokey shrubs that sometimes people get it confused with the roses. You can tell the difference because although they both will have pinnately compound leaves, raspberry leaves are much larger and usually only have about three leaflets per leaf, while our roses typically have five to seven smaller leaflets. And black raspberries also make black raspberries, which are delicious. And finally, Japanese barberry is the last alternately branching shrub we'll cover. This is another invasive species that has escaped from landscaping and now is invading our natural areas. The leaves and the branching pattern of this shrub are pretty distinct. They have alternate leaves or alternate clusters of small oval shaped leaves with no serrations. And they have a solitary straight thorn at the base of each leaf or each cluster of leaves. And this is another one of our shrubs with a colorful underbark. So if you take a knife and expose that, it'll be a bright fluorescent yellow. Okay, our final group for this ID video will be shrubs with opposite branching. We'll start with the natives and with one of our most common groups, the dogwoods. In our uplands and wetlands, we'll find thickets of gray dogwood. This is another colony former, so you can look for the structure of a million thin branches coming out of the ground. The bark is pretty nondescript and gray. An easy way to ID any dogwood is by its leaf. They have an elliptic leaf with indented veins that curl up towards the tip, almost like buckthorn, but dogwoods have a very elastic material in their veins, so if you carefully break the leaf tissue and stretch it apart, the veins will actually stretch and the bottom of the leaf will hang there in midair, so it's a great way to identify any dogwood. Another common dogwood in our area is red osier dogwood. So this one has an obvious bright red bark. It's pretty hard to confuse that with any other shrub around here. And it forms fairly large multi-branch shrubs in our wetlands rather than a suckering colony. One final dogwood we'll cover and a total rule breaker is pagoda dogwood or alternate leaf dogwood. Unlike the other opposite branching dogwoods, this one decided to be alternate. 
and it also has a form that's really more like a small tree than a shrub. It does have those characteristic dogwood leaves, so you can check for that. This tree also likes it somewhat wet and usually at least partially shady. Another one of our native shrubs is black elderberry. This shrub can be found in a wide variety of habitats and it tolerates quite a bit of disturbance. When identifying this shrub, I typically look for the unusual bark. It has very warty bark. By that, I mean it's smooth with a lot of raised circles all over it. And to me, it looks like it almost has like a light purplish, like mauve sheen to the bark. The leaves are pretty distinct. This is another one of our oppositely branched shrubs and it has fairly large compound leaves, pinnately compound leaves, usually with about seven leaflets per leaf. One of my favorite parts about this shrub is that if it gets enough sunlight, it'll create an amazing array of large white panicles of flowers that can be quite showy and actually stand out even when you're driving down the road and there's elderberries in the ditch. This shrub's form is usually a multi-stemmed arching form that can look a little untidy at times. One shrub can take up a whole lot of room, but it's a cool shrub. We have several species of viburnums in our area, both native and non-native. Our most common native viburnum is nannyberry. This one has opposite simple leaves that are fairly nondescript. They're just elliptic with a serrated margin. The older bark can start getting pretty rough, while the younger bark will be slightly purple in color with speckles. And we usually find this one in our wetland areas. A common non-native viburnum is highbush cranberry. There is a native version of highbush cranberry, but that one is pretty restricted to very high quality wetlands. The non-native highbush cranberry grows everywhere in our county, in our wetlands, in our woodlands, prairies. It's, that one's really not too choosy. And the difference between the two of them is, that's pretty advanced, so we're not gonna cover that in this video. The leaves of this shrub are, they're actually pretty much the same shape as our maple leaves, and it also has opposite branching. The leaves, however, are quite a bit smaller than a maple leaf, and the shrub itself, it, it has a pretty obvious shrub form, these arching branches, so it's pretty unlikely that you would confuse this one for a tree. Another invasive shrub in our area is winged burning bush. So I usually get some backlash from people when I call this one invasive, uh, simply because people love it. It turns a brilliant red in fall and people get really upset when you tell them that their favorite shrub is an invasive species. So if that's you and you love your burning bush, it's okay if you don't cut it down. You can plant natives somewhere else on your property, and when your winged burning bush dies, just replace it with a hazelnut. So winged burning bush has pretty obvious twigs. They have these angular brown wings that come out of this bright green twig. The leaves themselves are nondescript, like a lot of our opposite shrubs. They're just elliptic and serrated. Okay, and now we've saved the worst for last, our honeysuckle. So this one's kind of tied with buckthorn as one of our worst problematic invasive species. Once again, if you look at a woodland and it's so thick that there's no way you even want to walk through that thing, um, there's a good chance there's honeysuckle in there. Honeysuckle has a... Uh, pretty obvious like shrub shape to it it's it's pretty messy and the bark is it's very tan in color and it's made of these flat thin like scaly plates the leaves themselves are just that uh elliptic kind of pattern usually there's not any serrations on the edges of the leaves usually those margins are smooth 
You can also check the twigs of a honeysuckle will be hollow inside. Okay, thank you all for watching and hopefully you all can get on out soon and start identifying those trees.